Okay, well, we're going to look at a little bit more about uh, the church itself um, in this in this uh, lesson. So first off, let's look at the structure of the church. Now, the church is one body, and it ha should have one purpose. And you have all of these different people aimed towards the same goal, but all a little bit different. I mean, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you aren't all fingers. Um, so we all we are we all are a little bit different. Some of us are fingers, some of us are toes. Um, Romans chapter 15 verses 5 through 7 says this. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. So that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how many times he said one? Therefore accept one another. Accept one another. Just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. See, in the church there are going to be some people who are real political. They're going to be Republicans and Democrats and that's okay. You're going to have in the same church, you're going to have some people who just don't care about politics at all. That's okay too. You're going to have some people who are black, some people who are white, some people who are brown. That's the church. It's supposed to consist of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, and they all come together for one purpose. That's that's the, that's the purpose of the church. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man do, uh, destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and what and that is what you are. And then in Galatians 3, I hope that this is kind of helping you to see a picture of what God has made us. He's give, He's making us something that we were not before. Galatians 3, 26 through 27, or I'm sorry, through 28 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you... Who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither uh, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Of course, we all have different roles, but he's talking about our identity. So, uh, well, let's go ahead and read Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Now, this is a passage that has been on my mind so much, so much lately. Um, it... I just, it's one of those things that I never realized was there. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love united in spirit, intent and on, uh, I'm sorry, intent on one purpose. Now, here in verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Wow. And you can keep reading that passage there. Um, we'll stop there. So the church is the, the congregation. That's what the word means. Um, it comes from church from a Greek word, ecclesia. It, it, it's, 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 it, the church, as we think of it, is not a building. It's, it's, it's a congregation, a, a group of people. It's the saints. We're called saints. We're called the body of Christ. And if you are saved, it's you. There is no one greater in God's kingdom. Everyone is either saved or not saved. If you are saved, you reflect God to the world. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that also means that everything you do is a church function. So, oh, I don't feel like going to church today. You are the church. Get up and go to church and get up and go to service. <laughs> okay, so uh, everything you do is a church function. We do not celebrate any Jewish festivals since Christ fulfilled the law. Um, there's some confusion on this sometimes. Um, where people feel like, oh, well, I have to observe maybe the Passover. Well, if you observe the Passover as the Jews do, you're kind of, in a way, denying Christ because the Passover is to look forward to that. And if you if you if you partake of that, you're looking forward to something that's already come, and by doing that, you're rejecting Christ. Now, what if you're doing the Passover more as a historical thing to remember? The exodus from Egypt, well, 
I mean, that's fine, just as long as there has to be some kind of acceptance of Christ, maybe communion. In fact, in the New Testament, it makes it absolutely clear that the communion has taken the place of the Passover for the Christians. Um, so know why uh, the Jewish, Jewish celebrations are practiced you know, among Jews, and that will help you to figure out um, how it's really not for us Christians. And you might think, well, that's a weird thing to throw in here. You'd be surprised how many people have questions about that. So uh, be aware of complaining. Complaining causes disunity. It disrupts the activity of the Holy Spirit. If you're wanting to be used by God, don't complain. Complaining is focus. <laughs> if, uh, complaining is any time that you are nitpicking about the situation or you're just not happy or you know fill in the blank. You know what complaining is. It focuses attention away from God and onto things that don't matter. Like, for instance, sometimes people who complain about um, the way that some churches don't have pews. I know that seems like a pretty stupid thing to complain about to a lot of people, but it happens. Or another thing that um, people who are too bored and have too much time on their hands complain about is hymnals. You know, we should still be singing hymns, and why are there no hymnals in this church? And just making a big deal out of something that has nothing to do with reaching people for God's kingdom. Um, Complaining removes God's blessings. It makes us focus in on all the negative things, all the negative things. You know, oh, the, you know, nothing's going right, and it's like, no, there are stuff going right. You're just not paying attention to it. So, what's the purpose of the church? Um, living apart from the church is foreign to everything the Bible teaches. Everything the Bible teaches about it involves being connected with the church. So, for people who don't go to church and who have house churches instead of uh, real church, um, they kind of miss the whole point of what God said. We weren't meant to live in isolation. We were meant to live in fellowship. There's a lot of reasons. Um, we keep each other from believing just stupid and wrong things. Um, we uh, encourage each other, and we make sure that we're staying on track, just all kinds of stuff. So the body meets to, number one, be under authority. It's God's authority that we're under. He places some people in a position such as the pastor, but it's God's church, and God is the one in authority, and God is the one who gave us the idea of church. He said, hey, do this. Okay, so number one, we do it to submit to God, to be under his authority. Uh, we do it to discover God's direction. Um, God will lay stuff on the pastor's heart, and then um, people uh, will just, he'll just guide people, and the ministries will get started. And the idea is not that the pastor does ministry, does ministry. the idea is that the pastor helps you to do ministry. People, people miss that a lot of times. Um, we, the body meets to uh, strengthen one another, to prevent false teachings, uh, to worship God, to evangelize, to go out and, and witness to people, and to make disciples, to raise people up as stronger Christians, what this class is doing. Um, so uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, that, in that one he talks about, uh, he talks about, uh, um, how we are to go into all the world and teach, uh, preach the good news. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 4 through 31, he talks about. Well, I'll just turn there. Um, 12, 14 through 31. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, is not for this reason any, any of the less part of the body. And he's going through there once again, talking about how we are all part of the same body. Um, and then St. Corinthians 1.4 says, he's talking about comforting people, and he says, who comfort God comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. If we're li living ourselves all for ourselves, we can't really call ourselves a Christian. Uh, Hebrews 10.24-25, which says, do not forsake uh, meeting together, um, but all the more as you see the day approaching. James chapter 5, verse 14 which says, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It's meant to be a group thing. If you read in the law, he told the Israelites to camp among themselves, to camp together. So the fill in the blank there, the first one, in that first one, no one is greater. The second one in that first block, um, Jewish festival, since Christ fulfilled the law. So the first one is greater, the second one is fulfilled. So under the purpose heading, um, we haven't gotten to that one yet. So okay. And then in verse 16 in James chapter 5, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Excuse me. 
So then, uh, that takes us to the next part here. It's not just a place you go to get fed. I know people really, really have that in their head. Oh, I go to church to get fed. Well, then you're doing it wrong. First Thessalonians 5.13, and the fill in the blank there, by the way, is fed. First Thessalonians 5.14. No, that's not right, 5. 13. 5.13. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays an, um, another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Uh, on through 22. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's uh, will for you in Christ Jesus. That's that's his will for you, to give thanks, to pray without ceasing, to rejoice. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Okay. Really broad uh, passage there. You don't go to church to get fed. So then there's two kinds of callings that people have. The first is called a general calling. You know, oh, I don't feel called to this. I don't feel called to that. There's, there's two kinds of calling. The first is general. The calling that exists on every person to be saved and to, and to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's simple enough. Uh, Micah 6.8, uh, for instance, says, um, What have I commanded you but to act justly, to love mercy? And uh, then, in, then there's the special calling. That's a specific call placed on someone to do a specific ministry. Um, like, for instance, uh, to be a pastor. In Exodus 35, there's a guy named uh, Bezalel and Aholiab, two different guys. And God called them to do a specific task. In Proverbs chapter 15, 22... Without cons consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. So there's really two ways of finding a special calling. One is you're just naturally talented, and you can use what you have. This this is what I mean by it's not mystical. Um, widows and orphans, can you do anything to help them? Making time to bless others, can you clear out a little bit of your schedule to give someone some encouragement? Um you know, explore scripture. See, see what scripture has to say about things that, that, that are out there that we don't even have to pray about. We don't have to pray, God, do you want me to help orphans? Because his answer is yes. He's told us in his word to do that. So explore scripture. See see what God, says, God has to say. James 1.27 even says this. True and pure religion is taking care of it as an orphans. So if you think you're real religious and you're not helping anyone else, you're not real religious. Um, relig uh, m maturity is shown in serving people. So the fill in the blank, th the second fill in the blank under the heading of purpose is not mystical. So the first way is that the second way is when God calls you to do something that you're not comfortable with, and then He equips you to do it. Um, I hate being in front of people. I hate it. So then God called me to be a worship leader. Oh, okay. And I don't want to be a pastor. So God called you to be a pastor. See what I mean? And he equips you for the thing that he's called you to. So don't ask, oh, what if he calls me to do something that I don't want to do? He probably will because that's how we grow. We grow by sacrificing ourselves and our wants. Don't worry about that. Instead, seek after God and, and anything he brings you to, he'll bring you through. Um, just a few things. Moses was called to lead. Aaron was called as priest. Bezalel Bezal and Aholiab, I already mentioned them from Exodus chapter 35. Uh, they were called to make things. All Israel was called to be holy. See, this is just an example. You know, Moses had a specific calling. And see, how God came down to Moses probably isn't going to happen to us. He came down in a fiery bush. Most people look for some, you know, real big sign, you know, and light from above. When oftentimes God works in a lot more humble ways. And just less flashy so be humble in spirit focuses on God and serving others not on us finding our life purpose see what I mean when, when your focus is all on finding your life purpose you're not going to get your life purpose because you're going to make it too complicated not everyone receives a burning bush calling 
It's just doors that open, and are you willing to walk through them? Are you willing to walk through them when you don't get any recognition for walking through them? So, uh, so that takes us to what are ordinances? Now, ordinances, uh, the the Catholic Church, if you're familiar with them, they have something called sacraments, and these are things that are required uh, for salvation, basically. And I'm oversimplifying here, but it's that's a basic concept. Now, two of these things that they say um, Protestant churches also teach, non-Catholic non uh, Protestant churches, um, specifically our denomination, it's Assemblies of God, but we don't call them sacraments because they're commanded practices done in obedience. There is no special grace given to the partaker. It's not part of our salvation. It's just obedience to God. That's simple. Um, and we we call them ordinances in our church. Uh, there's there's no saving power. It's just memorial. There's there's two things that we do. The first is water baptism. Now there's been a lot of questions on this, so I'll try to make it you know relatively um, simple here. To baptize means to submerge. So that's why we believe in dunking the dunking the head under the water. The word literally means baptize. Baptizo from the Greek submerge. Um, we do not believe in uh, infant baptisms um, because uh, baptism is it's symbolic of the spiritual life. Down in death, up in new life. You have accepted Christ as your Savior. Babies can't accept Christ as their Savior, so they can't be baptized. We do baby dedications where we encourage the congregation, the family, to uh, make sure that this baby is taught in God's ways. But the choice still you know is up to the child um, water baptism does not save but it is an outward sign of an inward salvation if you have already been saved God tells us to be baptized to be baptized in Acts 238 it says um, be baptized uh, for sins uh, that basically means because of um, the on only the saved can be saved only the only saved can be baptized so what he's saying in Acts 238 is well I'll just read it I'll just read it, because I don't want to just keep talking in abstracts. I want you to kind of get what I'm saying here. 238 says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will be, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's not saying, be baptized, and that will get rid of sin. He's saying, be baptized for, which means because of, be baptized because of sins. Okay, so... Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ uh, because of the forgiveness of your sins. So keep that in mind. Um, I know that if you don't know what I'm talking about, this might seem a little bit confusing. But if you do know what I'm talking about, where you've been in a church where, where bat water baptism was a part of um, salvation and they taught you that, um, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So if this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. The, the moral of the story is... Or is um, that water baptism doesn't save. Um, infant baptism is pointless, even in lieu of circumcision. Uh, I know some people say, well, I don't circumcise my, my, my child. I, I did water baptism. It doesn't matter. Circumcision is no longer required, and infant baptism is pointless, so it really doesn't matter. Um, dedicating an infant, I already mentioned this, is for the parents and church to be challenged to actively raise up the child and surrender to God. We are baptized into the name of Jesus, or the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? We're baptized into his reputation. We're baptized into the worship and service of. We're baptized under his authority. Okay, It's by the authority of Jesus, or the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, that we are uh, baptized. Some people think that you have to be baptized um, in the name of Jesus. Some people think in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It really does not matter much at all. Um... So just a few things here. If you read in Matthew 28, 19, um, he talks about um, go and make disciples uh, in, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so that's kind of what I was talking about there. Um, okay, so let me make sure I didn't miss any fill in the blanks here. Baptize, the fill in the blank there is submerge. Infant baptism is pointless even in lieu of circumcision. If you look, you look in Galatians 6, 15, he talks about how circumcision is pointless <coughs> excuse me so then that takes us to communion this is the second of the two ordinances the first was water baptism the second is communion we believe that God commands us to do these things but they're not 
um, you don't you aren't saved by doing them. For instance, let's say somebody is on their deathbed and they accept Jesus Christ and they didn't have time to be water baptized or partake of communion. What happens then? Do they go to hell because they didn't do it? Well, no. Um, it's just something that as you grow in Christ, this is something that you start doing. Um, okay, so communion is the Christian substitute for the Jewish pa Passover. It says to take it frequently, not necessarily every week, not necessarily once a month. It just says to take it uh, frequently. It's recorded in Matthew 26, 20 through 30, Luke 22, 14 through 23, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Um, actually, the 1 Corinthians 5, 7... Um, is something I do want to read. But if you look on your sheet, all this is written on your sheet, so there's no reason for me to read through it. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover has all, um, also has been sacrificed. So that's where we get the idea that Christ is, um, the, the communion is the takeover for Passover. Um, it, what, what, is, what is the purpose of communion? It has a few different time, a few, few purposes, a few different purposes. First off, is a time of memorializing. You remember what Christ did and how he saved you. It is a time of thanksgiving. You're, you're thanking God for what he's done. A time of fellowshipping, something that the whole body comes together and partakes of this one activity. Um, kind of gives a sense of oneness. Uh, it uh, proclaims a new covenant it, it, for people who are new to the church. It just tells them um, about how... Um, how we've been saved by Christ's blood. Um, it encourages uh, Christian living because, um, you know, oh, look what Christ did. It encourages us to go and do likewise. Um, it uh, renews the responsibility of a right attitude and behavior. It, it is something that refocuses us. Uh, refocuses us. Um, it's, uh, it's only for the body uh, to do, the Christians to do. Uh, only the body of Christ should partake of communion. If you are not saved, you should not be taking communion. Um, God can afflict you with diseases sometimes. Um, that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians. Okay, so, uh, and one of the reasons why um, to remember about how holy communion is is because it's the takeover for Passover, and Passover was extremely holy. You could get kicked out of, out of uh, Israel if you didn't uh, do it right. So, um, okay, so let's say, go to reasons for leaving a church a little bit past the dryness of, I know that was a little, eh, you know, talking about the ordinances. What a big word, ordinance. Who thought of that, you know? It's just, ugh. Yeah, we should rename it something less terrible. <laughs> okay, so uh, there are a few reasons for leaving a church, but the problem is most people don't leave a church for a good reason. They usually leave for bad reasons. First really good reason to leave a church, it closes. That's a good reason to leave a church. Um, if there's no longer a church there, um, don't skip around from church to church. Um, you're just doing yourself a dis, dis, uh, disfavor. Uh, anyways, uh, when you aren't at a church for any longer than like ten years, you really don't you really don't build um, into the church very much. You take and then you cause a problem and you leave. So you didn't have a good relationship with the pa last pastor, but this time you think you're going to have a good good relationship. So, I mean, you have to go back to those places that you've left, and you have to get, get back on good terms, and then you can leave. I mean, you don't have to go back to the church, but you really need to resolve issues. As Christians, we need to learn how to resolve issues. So get involved. You know, the church is not a place where you go and listen to the pastor yammer. That's not what, what the church is about. The church is about us doing the work of God's kingdom, all of us. So get involved. Um, if they teach a different salvation or a different God, um, you don't want to be in kind of like a coexist church. There is only one God and only one way to heaven. Um, if you are for deployment, and I don't mean uh, uh, service, but I guess, you know, obviously that too. I'm talking about if God sends you to go somewhere, like for instance, if he calls you to be a missionary. John chapter 14, verse 6. Says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Um, so deployment, Acts 13, 1 through 4, it mentions where they were sent out. Um, another reason is leading of the Spirit. But here's the problem. People, people convince themselves in their heads what they want. And then they look for mystical signs to confirm what they already believe. Oh, oh, oh 
well, um, uh, oh, I saw this on TV, or I saw this when I was driving, or I heard, somebody said this, and it just, it just confirmed something in my spirit. It's like, well, you're already looking for a mystical sign. So this whole leading of the spirit has to be with discretion, with discretion. You have to be willing to go where God wants, because if you pray, God, please to, uh, send me somewhere else, he probably will. But that doesn't mean it was what he wanted. It doesn't mean that it was what was right. Um, you know, God wants us to grow. God wants us to grow. Um, okay, so not where, and by the way, I'm not meaning to imply that God, you know, somehow acts immorally. That's not what I'm, well, my point is. My point is, sometimes God allows us to do something if we ask long enough, even though it's not what he wanted. Um, we see this, for instance, in the book of Numbers. We don't go where feels good. We go where God wants. So this is after soul searching. It's after prayer. It's after godly advice. Not people who would tell you what you want to hear, but godly advice. And it's not to escape her feelings. You need to stick out, outlast the problems. You need to be there uh, and, and just be willing to get hurt and be willing to grow. Um, I, I know, oh, well, I've been hurt by people in the church. I, I get that. I have too. I've been in a lot of really bad situations. But here's the situation. I don't go to God. I don't go to church because of people. I go to church because of God. God told me to do it. That's how I grow. That's how we all grow, whether we admit it or not. That's how we grow. Staying in the Word. That's how we grow. Praying. That's how we grow. So let's real quickly talk about timeliness in Luke chapter 10. Verse 38 through 42. Um, now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So there's just a few things I want to mention. First off, there's a time for everything. There's a time for fellowship. There's a time to learn. There's a time to worship. There's a time to witness. There's a time to pray. What we do is sometimes we get things out of order. So we go to church, and we're talking during worship. You shouldn't be talking during worship. Um, when the pastor's preaching, we go out into the hallway and, and, and joke around with people. You should be listening to the sermon. Or, oh, I didn't make it to church on Sunday because I was off doing something else. Manage your time better. You need church. Um, so, okay, that's I mentioned in Ecclesiastes uh, is a good part of it. But Mark chapter 6, verse 30, um, says, The apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. There's a time for everything. Even Jesus practiced this. And remember, God himself made a seventh day for rest. Uh, don't be a distraction. Do things for God's glory and the church's benefit. Um, it's best to just stay quiet when the words are being given, unless God specifically gives you a word. Don't just say something that's on your mind. You know when God is giving you a word. I mean, it's it's like there's a burning, and um, you can't not say something. And God just has a way of confirming with you, say this and say it now. But, uh, okay, so God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. Um, remember that. Um, things are meant to be done in an orderly fashion. Oh, well, I believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. I do too, but that doesn't mean it has to be complete chaos. So if you have any questions about any of this, uh, please post it below. And I will do my best to answer them as quickly as I can. Uh, the next lesson, I'm sorry, I have not finished up with the uh, fill in the blanks. Um, the last one we did was circumcision. In the section reasons for leaving a church, the fill in the blank is leading of the of the spirit. And then on, under the heading timeliness, time for everything. Um, the next lesson will be on outreach. Um, I hope you I really hope you're learning from this and it's challenging you to see God in a deeper way.